see we are using very beautiful of these actions to show how to understand the graph. And it's good for the teacher as well. We teach them some skills for the student. Thank you. Okay, so this is not uh, as good as the program you were watching before this lecture started. Okay. Uh, it was a very interesting and funny program that you were watching. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, crystallography from almost a zero knowledge. So stop me if there's something that you don't understand. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about crystals and their structure and how we describe directions and planes in crystals, uh, the reciprocal lattice, and finally finish off by looking at groups of crystals, so for example the boundaries between crystals. First of all, to define, uh, define what a crystal is, basically a crystal has long-range periodicity. So, if I find that I have a green atom and a red atom here, I can say for sure that I will have another green atom and another red atom and a green atom and red atom for a long distance. And that's what a crystalline state means. And that is in contrast to an amorphous state where there is no long range periodicity. <coughs> if I say I have a blue atom here, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have another blue atom exactly at the right spacing over here and here and here. There is no long-range order in the amorphous state. And these days we can produce the amorphous state in many different materials. I mean, window glass is amorphous silica. But we can also produce amorphous metals. So, for example, here uh, is a very hot uh, liquid of metal. For example, it could be a mixture of iron and boron. And we pour it onto a rotating copper wheel. Then the cooling rate is about 10 to the 6 Kelvin per second, and you end up with a ribbon which does not have a crystalline structure. It's actually metallic, so it conducts electricity, it looks like a metal, but if you looked at it in the microscope, there would be no structure at all, no grain boundaries, no, uh, no diffraction peaks, and so forth. And because there aren't any of those defects, the corrosion resistance of something like this can be quite high compared with normal uh, crystalline iron. And similarly, because there are none of those defects like grain boundaries, magnetic domains can move very easily. So something like this has application in the making of uh, transformers where you need a very small hysteresis loop uh, uh, so that the transformer doesn't heat up. And this is a real picture of molten metal being, uh, uh, being poured onto a rotating copper wheel and you end up with these ribbons of amorphous metal. So that is what the metal looks like. So there's no, no particular kind of material which can be glassy or crystalline. If you give some materials enough time to arrange into a long range periodic array, then they will become crystalline. If you don't give it enough time, they will become amorphous without any long-range order. Now, if, if I ask the ordinary person in the street, what are these? They would say they are crystals. Okay? First of all, because they look extremely beautiful and they have really nice facets on the surface because they have formed deep inside the earth had a very long time to grow into their equilibrium shape. But in the context of engineering and material science, crystals can be any shape, really. The only definition is that there must be long-range order in the arrangement of atoms. So here, for example, is a jet engine, and the jet engine contains turbine blades. And deep inside the engine, are the blades which operate at a very, very high temperature. They operate in an environment which is greater than the melting temperature of the alloy. So the temperature is 1400 degrees centigrade, 
hands and the blades uh, are made out of nickel alloys and they have coatings on them which prevent the temperature from getting to 1400 degrees centigrade and there's also cooling air at 600 degrees centigrade passing through the blades. Now, obviously because they're operating at a high temperature and turning at something like 30,000 revolutions per minute, there are stresses. So the blades tend to get longer and longer with time by creep. So to reduce the creep rate, you make them as single crystals. So this whole blade is one crystal. And the way that you make it into a single crystal is that you start solidification from here. Okay? So let's imagine that this is very hot here and underneath this point is a cold zone. So you start solidification here and lots and lots of crystals nucleate as I pull the blade into the cold zone. As they grow, only one of the crystals makes it through this helix. And that crystal then grows into a single crystalline blade. So this is as much a crystal as these crystals. It just has a shape which is that of a turbine blade. Similarly, when we make lasers, you know, the crystals are in the form of cylinders rather than faceted crystals. So a shape of a crystal is not important from an engineering point of view. We don't necessarily want faceted crystals. We can make them into the shape of a turbine blade or a cylinder or whatever shape that we want. The main definition of a crystal is that it has long-range periodicity. Now, of course, if I take a crystal of iron and then I add manganese to it, we have lost long-range periodicity because the manganese atoms are dispersed at random. So, I can't really say that it is crystalline in the strict sense of the definition. But we will ignore that. Okay, we will say that, okay, the manganese atoms are occupying the iron positions and therefore we still have periodicity with respect to translation, but not periodicity with respect to the identification of the element. Okay. So, a solid solution, which is random, is only approximately crystalline. Most of the materials that we use are not single crystals. They, they consist of lots and lots of crystals put together. So this, for example, is a, a copper, and here you see one crystal, and inside it is another crystal. This is an annealing grain, but just like this crystal, it is also another grain. It just happens to have a shape, which is very regular, you know, a parallel sided shape because those are interfaces which have a low energy. So it's tending to pass it on those planes. But this is as much a grain as this. It has a different orientation, crystallographic orientation. Okay, so let's go back to basics and define what we mean by this long-range periodicity. And at first, I'm not going to talk about atoms. I'm going to talk about lattice points. Okay, so these are imaginary points that we put. Uh, here is a point which has exactly the same environment as this point, and this point, and this point. And that is the definition of a lattice point. That around this point, the environment is identical. Okay. So if I, if I place a flower at each lattice point, then I have to place the flower in exactly the same orientation for this to remain the lattice point. And to describe this pattern, we draw a unit cell between the lattice points. And the unit cell is chosen in such a way that these vectors, the basis vectors, are the shortest that we can use, and the angles here are as close to 90 degrees as possible. Because if you choose the unit cell in that way, then it reflects the symmetry of the pattern better. Yeah, yesterday, I showed you that if I have a regular set of points, I can draw an infinite number of different kinds of unit cells. It doesn't have to be a rectangular lattice, as over here. 
if I draw the same pattern on here, of course I can draw a unit cell which is of this shape. And that still represents the same array of points. It doesn't have to be rectangular. But this is a nice shape. It reflects the symmetry of the pattern. So it is sensible that we choose lattice parameters which are the shortest lattice parameters and angles which are as close to 90 degrees as possible. The second condition for the choice of the unit cell is that we must be able to put unit cells next to each other and fill all space. So for example, this is not a unit cell. Okay? Because the next unit cell will be here and this space is left empty. Okay? So a unit cell is such that it must, when I put lots of unit cells together, it must completely fill space. So I can stack unit cells together to reproduce the pattern. In three dimensions, the problem is the same, uh, except I have an additional vector here, A3. These are the three lattice parameters, and these are the lattice points. Now, in two dimensions, there are only five possible ways in which I can have a regular pattern. Okay, only five possible unit cells. That is very surprising, isn't it? But to get a regular set of points, there are only five possible ways in which I can have those points. So, one is a square pattern, you have a rectangular pattern, you have a parallelogram, okay, and you might have a... a parallelogram which has a particular angle of 60 degrees and that is different from a general parallelogram and so on. If you think about all possible ways of arranging regular patterns, there are only five possible cells that you can have. So supposing you were making uh, a design, a wallpaper design, then you, if you were using regular points, you can only have five different wallpapers. every possible pattern that has been printed in two dimensions has only five repeat units. Okay. Now, in three dimensions, in three dimensions, there are only 14 different ways of arranging a regular set of points. And these are called the 14 Rabe lattices. Now, one of these is the body centered cubic crystal structure. Uh, here we are talking about lattice points again, so this is the body centered cubic lattice. Now, we are going to go on to talk about really complicated crystal structures. And it becomes difficult to draw them in three dimensions. But there is a very easy way of representing even very complicated crystal structures. And that is, instead of drawing a three-dimensional structure, we project it along this axis. Okay. So this is a projection of this lattice in two dimensions. And the half over here represents the height of that, uh, of that lattice point. When we don't label the points, they are located at 0 and 1. So these points are at 0 and 1, 0 and 1, 0 and 1, 0 and 1, and that's at a half. Now, in this particular case, it's easy to draw a three-dimensional cell. But when we get to complicated structures later, it will be impossible to visualize them in three dimensions very easily. So this is a very nice method of representing a unit cell in three dimensions. This is the face-centered cubic lattice. And if I draw a structure uh, a lattice projection, then these are the face-centering lattice points. That means this one, this one, this one, and this one. And this is also a face-centering, but that's located at 1 and 0, height of 1 and 0. And these are the lattice points which are at the corners 
this is called the primitive atomic cell. So it's primitive because there is only one lattice point per unit cell. If you look at these lattice points at the corners, only one eighth of each lattice point belongs to this cell because there are eight cubes at each corner. Right. If I take that and I multiply it by eight, then there's only one lattice point in the cell. So that is what we mean by a primitive cell. There's only one lattice point in the cell. By contrast, the body-centered cubic cell has two lattice points because in addition to the ones at the corner which are shared between eight cubes, you have this one which is completely inside that cell. So there are two lattice points per cell and this is not a primitive cell. So the meaning of primitive is that you have just one lattice point per unit cell. So I've described to you three different kinds of cubes and they're summarized over here. Uh, this notation here comes from the German language because the Germans did a lot of the early crystallography. So this is the structure project, uh, the lattice projection for cubic P, means primitive cubic, where you only have lattice points at the corners of the unit cell. This is the projection for the body-centered cubic or cubic I cell, where you have a lattice point at a half height and at the corners, and this is the projection for the cubic F or face-centered cubic cell. Now, we saw that in the cubic system we have three different cells possible. Uh, this is primitive, body-centered, and face-centered. But they all have cubic symmetry. They're all cubes. So we call this the cubic system. And there are seven different systems which are listed over here. So cubic has the highest symmetry with all the lattice parameters being equal and all the angles being 90 degrees. Then we have hexagonal where one of the lattice parameters is different and one of the angles is 120 degrees. Trigonal, we have tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic and triclinic where nothing is identical. This is the trigonal cell, where all, all, uh, sorry, triclinic cell, where all the lattice parameters are different and all the angles are different. So this has the lowest symmetry of the systems that are illustrated in the last slide. So far, we are not talking about crystal structure. These are all imaginary lattice points. Now. I said to you that in three dimensions there are only 14 possible ways of arranging points which are regular, which constitute regular arrays of points. And those 14 arrangements are called the Brave lattices. We have the cubic system here, we have the hexagonal and trigonal system. This is tetragonal where we only have primitive and body-centered tetragonal. There is no face-centered tetragonal. Any idea why we cannot have a face-centered tetragonal lattice? So imagine that these are four unit cells 
of face centered tetragonal lattice. Okay? So the C axis is pointing out of the board and it's longer than this axis and this axis. So we have four unit cells. Now, if I draw lines over here, then you can see this is a body centered tetragonal cell. Okay? So it's not different from this cell. So that's the reason why we don't have a face centered tetragonal cell. It's identical to the body centered tetragonal cell. Autorhombic means A, B, and C is different. All the angles are 90, and we can get primitive, we can get body centered, face centered. And this is a case where only one set of parallel faces has the lattice point in the middle. And finally, we have monoclinic, primitive, and one of the faces with the centering lattice point, okay, here and here, and triclinic, primitive. Okay, so these are the only 14 possible arrays of points, regular arrays of points that you can have in three dimensions. Everyone happy so far with the definition of lattices? Okay, so to summarize, lattice points have identical environments. That means if I move from one lattice point to another lattice point, then I don't see any difference at all. So they have identical environments. A unit cell must fill space. So when I put one unit cell on top of another, there mustn't be a hole left. And we define a unit cell with the help of three vectors, which are the lattice whose magnitudes are the lattice parameters, A1, A2, and A3, and the angles are alpha, beta, and gamma. And in three dimensions, there are 14 possible Bravais lattices. Now, very often, we need to define uh, directions within the lattice. And directions are very easy to specify. Given that we've defined our unit cells with Q vectors, any other vector can be expressed as a linear combination of those two vectors. So, for example, this particular direction here is 1 along A1 and 1 along A2, so we call it the 1-1 one, one direction. And we use square brackets like this to identify directions. In three dimensions, uh, the vector u will have component u1 along A1, u2 along A2, and u3 along A3. So we have u1, u2, A, and u3 as its direction indices. It's just like normal vectors. Any idea what this, the indices of this one should be? Yeah. So, it has a component 1 along A1 okay, and a half along A2. So, I would write that as 1 and a half, but it's not nice to have fractions, yeah? So you multiply until you, everything becomes an integer, so that becomes the 2-1 direction. So we don't use fractional indices. We simply m multiply to remove any fractions. Uh, how about this vector? What would you label u as? Louder? Somebody said it. Minus, 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 one. Minus, one. Yeah. minus one along A1 and one along A2. So you write it as bar one, one. Okay. We don't put the minus sign in front of the one, but instead, by convention, we write it on top. Bar one, one. And in this case, we are going 2 along A1, so it would be 2, and 1 along A2, so it's a 2-1 direction. 
So, indexing directions is fairly straightforward. Whether it's in two dimensions or in three dimensions. In this case, uh, this vector is one along A1, one along A2, and one along A3. So this is the one, one, one direction. And in this one, we go zero along A, A1, one along A2, and one along A3. So it's a zero, one, one direction. Now, if you look at this uh, cubic system, then this direction is the one zero zero direction. Yeah. So one along here, and nothing along A2, nothing along A3. This direction is the zero one zero direction. However, if I had chosen this to be A1 and this to be A2, then this one would become zero one zero and this one would become one zero zero. These directions are crystallographically the same. They have the same distance between lattice points. And in fact, I can find six different directions in this, which are crystallographically identical. And the specific indices that we use really depends on where I, what I call A1, what I call A2, and what I call A3. So, to indicate directions which are crystallographically equivalent, we use brackets like this, and we say directions of the form 100. Zero zero. So, so to indicate that it could be any direction of this kind, we use brackets like these to say it's 100 zero zero type direction. Yeah? Because physically there's no difference. If I measured the modulus along here, it would be exactly the same as the modulus along here as along here. So it makes sense to refer to a set of crystallographically equivalent directions using brackets like these. Now, the indexing of planes is a little bit more difficult. 